Dang, it's bright up here. <laughs> Somewhere in this audience is Barbara McDonald. And Barbara is the person who's responsible for teaching me how to teach. And several years ago, when I used to lecture, I went into her office one day after having lectured and she having evaluated me, and she said, Ron, you can't just go up there and talk for 50 minutes. You have to tell people what you're going to talk about. And so I'm going to I'm going to take Barbara's advice today. We just heard Ken Robinson talk about the need for revolution. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to deliver a message of need. Fortunately, after that message of need, there's a message that there's a path forward, and that that path forward is available to us. And then finally, I'm going to talk about that path, that revolution taking place right here in northeastern Minnesota. One of my first orders of business is to, to send regrets from Dr. Sue Collins. Sue is the president of our five community and technical colleges in North, northeastern Minnesota. She was going to deliver the first part of this message, but she can't be here today, so I'm doing it for her. Sue, uh, Sue's dream, Sue's message of need, has to do with some numbers. In, in uh, our region, how many people graduate from high school? Uh, look at there, 88% of the students in our region graduate from high school, and we're ahead of the, the national average. Good for us. Uh-oh. Of those high school graduates, only 28% go on to get a college degree. That's a problem. We saw on one of Dane's slides that by the year 2018, we need to have 70% uh, of the jobs are going to require college education. And, and Sue's message is, you know what, 28% isn't good enough for our region. And the second part of Sue's message is that our learners are transforming. And it's time that we transform with them. So there's Sue's message of need. Now here's Ron's message of need. Fifty years ago, a television might have looked something like this. Today, a television is a completely different thing. We've had tremendous innovation. Fifty years ago, a classroom might have looked something like this. Today, it still does. Now, it'd be an interesting sociological study just to go back and forth between these, look at the dress and posture of the people, and so on and so forth. <laughs> it's not my message. I'm an engineering educator, and so that's what I'm going to talk about right now. In engineering education, we're responsible for creating the next generation of innovators the people who can innovate as uh, electronics and electrical engineers and take that TV of 1960 and make it a TV of 2010. But we aren't innovating ourselves. My colleague Dan is going to come up after me. He and I were at a regional university in the 1980s learning engineering. We learned it from people who had learned it in the same rooms in the 1960s. And if we were to go to that same regional university today, the same things would be being said and being done. We do not have that innovation in our own education, and yet we're the people responsible for creating the innovators. Somewhere around the mid-1990s, a lot of research started being uh, published on the cognitive psychology of how people learn. So they developed what are called the seven principles of learning. Now, just last Friday, I was working with some students at Itasca Community College and helping them learn to become better presenters. And I gave them this piece of advice. I said, as soon as you read a slide to an audience, you have told them, you're so dumb you can't read, I have to do it for you. 
So this is really challenging for me as we go through these next seven slides for me not to turn and read them to you. <laughs> Let's take a look at these principles of learning and see how many of them resonate with the things we heard already here today from our own TED speakers and on the TED Talks. As I go through the first two principles of learning, I've color-coded them green. And I think uh, my message here is that even in that linear, passive learning model, those two things can be addressed. But as you go through the rest of the seven, they really can't. In fact, uh, there aren't a lot of people who even know what metacognition is. Yet it's the third principle of learning. Ken Robinson was talking about individuality in learning. Dan and I were talking last night about a new method that he's using in his classroom. He says, I don't know how to judge whether it's working or not. And I said, that's really easy, Dan. All you have to do is see if they're coming to class and really engaged. That means they're motivated to learn it. We've heard a couple things today about inclusion. And then as Olivia was talking and talking about the importance of community, I was thinking about the seventh principle of learning. So these are in red because I don't think they're addressed by the passive learning model. When Ken Robinson was talking about individualized learning, I just couldn't see him thinking about that lecture hall where the students develop their own curriculum and then it's externally supported. Right here, right now in northeastern Minnesota, we have that revolution of education. It's in engineering education. It has grown out of the great practices at Itasca Community College and is now called Iron Range Engineering. This is our classroom. One is the teacher, one is the student. That's how they interact. This is as big as our student uh, interactions get in groups of, of three or four, talking to each other, trying to learn this craft called engineering. They are only in class together for two hours a week. They are on campus 50 to 60 hours a week. They spend that time going through a bunch of different activities. Half of it they spend solving a, uh, product, a, a problem for an industry client or starting up their own business. And as, if, if you think that that's at the core of what engineers do is solve problems and, and manage projects, then you think of, well, what skills do they need around that? And the skills that they need around that are are excellent communication. They have to be ethical practitioners. They have to be, and this is above all, learners. I tell students that when they go to solve that first project, their company's gonna be paying them $60,000 a year, and they, they go and they realize there's a knowledge base that I need here to solve this problem. Now, of that, let's call that 100% of the knowledge that I need to solve the problem. I ask them, how much do you think is going to come forward from college? And they always say, oh, but maybe 20%. I say, oh, how much is going to come from your other life experiences? Well, maybe another 20 or 30%. Then I say, where's the last 50% going to come from? And that's when the realization steps in. They have to have the skill to go and learn it. Our students at Iron Range Engineering do all these things. Guess what? They know what metacognition is. Not only do they know what it is, they know how to do it. And they apply the principles of metacognition, being able to describe the processes through which they learned, being able to evaluate how good are those processes, and then being able to regulate and change their learning based on that evaluation. And they do this in the confines of gathering all the technical knowledge, all the professional skills, and applying that 30 to 40 hours a week, dressed like professionals should dress, acting like professionals should act. And then we put these people in contrast 
with me when I graduated with my engineering degree or with Dan when he graduated with his. We were very one-dimensional. We could solve problems in the back of the book. But as I tell my students, what's not going to happen on that first day of class, or that first day of work, rather, is your boss isn't going to say, here's a book. Solve the problems in the back of the book by Friday, and if you get them right, we'll pay you. <laughs> That's not what engineering is. Engineering is all these other things that I've described. And we're doing that right here, right now, in northeastern Minnesota. I'm going to bring up my colleague Dan to talk about what that means for our region. Uh, I've been following Ron for about 30 years, and I see today is no different. I get to follow him again. And let me tell you, when you're behind Ron, the view isn't always the best. Um, uh, one of the things that's a hallmark of the program that um, Ron's talking about in Iron Range Engineering is that it's project-based learning. So the students really don't take traditional classes. They go in and they do projects. And uh, they have conversations with faculty. They learn the technical material. But they're also doing. And that's one of the key things. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. And I'm excited to be here today because, first of all, the conversations that I've been part of today have been awesome. I mean, I'm just so thrilled to hear the different views of different things and, and all, bringing together the inclusion, the education, and the economic development. I'm shifting gears here. I'm going to go into economic development. I'm going to come back to the Iron Range Engineering Program by the time I'm done. Hey, you cheated me. Can we reset the clock to 18? <laughs> I'm, I'm going without slides just to keep it moving fast. Um, we all know, as we're painfully aware, that there's, uh, the global economics is um, interconnected that an economic event happening in one part of the world affects our world. And uh, that plays into what we're talking about today as far as education. I'll get, get on with that in just a second. The second thing that we're aware of, I'm sure, is that China and India both have experienced explosive growth and slated to uh, overcome the, the U.S. Um, economy in the years to come, and, and may not even be years. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that India and China each alone produce 10 times the number of engineers that we do in the United States. Okay? Think about that. In my travels to India, I've seen innovation centers. And innovation centers is really a uh, higher education central point surrounded by companies that work with that higher education entity to develop innovation and commercialization, improve the competitiveness of those companies, and to uh, start new companies. And back in the day, in the early 2000, uh, uh, Tom Friedman's book, uh, where he said, we, we know what India's going to do five years from now, it's what we're doing today. The idea was that India and China would be doing commodified engineering tasks. Uh, they didn't get that memo. In fact, I don't think they read the book, because they see their future as innovation, and they have ten times the number of people to do it. So how will we position ourselves to be in that economic uh, world and be competitive? We're, we're not going to win on numbers, we're going to have to win on a system. And by win, I mean compete and, and for our, ourselves and for our region. So what's the implications for Northeast Minnesota? Ron just described the IRE model. And one of the things, the hallmarks of IRE is that students are required to participate and to expose, um, be exposed to ideas and entrepreneurialism. And so all students are going to go through that process. And back when I... Um, when I first started at Iron Range, I'm no longer there, but uh, Ron got rid of me. But um, when, I, uh, when I was there, I met some interesting people over at Iron Range Resources, and they decided that the Minnesota Business Plan, business, Minnesota Cup Business Plan Competition was going to be the uh, marquee event that would showcase innovation in Northeast Minnesota. Minnesota Business Plan, um, Minnesota Cup Business Plan Competition has over a thousand um, entries each year in diff different divisions. And so uh, we set about entering our projects into that. 
In the first year, that was 2010, the uh, program started in January, um, and by that summer we had entered four projects in that, three of which made the top ten. One made the top three, but we did not win our division that year. And we looked at why, and the problem was that we're engineers. Uh, we need business people. And so we talked to Minnesota State University Mankato, put their um, business faculty and students on our teams, and fast forward to 2011, submitted two projects, one made the top 10, one made the, that one made the top three, and that one won. I'm going to go back to 2010 just a second. Uh, one of the projects finished in the top 10 of the biosciences division. Um, that, that project now has formed a corporation and is weeks away from its initial round funding to, to start a new company. So, what do we do? We have, and this is the exciting part of this talk, you have Iron Range Engineering, and it, it, it's fed by schools in particular like um, ICC, and you've got an engine for innovation, and it's proven. Up to this point, it's proven. What's lacking is what happens after these projects get vetted either through business plan competitions. So here's a call to action. Here's a call to action to the leaders that are sitting out in this crowd today. We need leaders to step up in academia, in the finance sector, in industry, and in government. And we need to get those leaders together to say, once we have these innovations, how do we grease the skids? Remember the railroad thing today? Let's grease those skids and let's get these things commercialized. Let's spin out companies. Let's have wealth generation in this region. You have the pieces here. It'll just take leadership to do that. So my call to action is that. But I want to leave you with this final thought that what you have is something that's probably not been seen before as far as the educational model and combining that with economic development. You have a hybrid system. You don't have an education system. You have a hybrid system. And the only way that we will position our region, our state, in fact, our nation, in this new economic reality that's upon us is to have the ability to um, have innovation earlier and to have a system that's highly efficient in spinning out companies. And I have a flashing red seven, and I did it even though you shortchanged me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.